And open up your Bibles to John chapter number 15. John chapter number 15. <clears throat> There's a struggle in the, in the life of a Christian uh, to stay on the right track uh, when it comes to uh, serving God, pleasing God, and, and developing this new life in Christ, which we've been blessed with, which we is a gift from God. <clears throat> And the struggle comes because of worldly attractions, because of temptations from uh, the enemy of, of your soul, Satan, and, and the desire that's within you because the Holy Spirit is, is dwelling inside of the believer. Mm -hmm. that, that's just something God has done, and you just have to believe that he's done it. So that when you do something wrong, you're, you're more convicted than you were than when you did it when you were not saved. That Holy Spirit brings to remembrance things you heard, the preaching uh, of the Word of God, the, the telling of the truth that God would have us to walk in as a light and a guide in this life. And oftentimes, things get in the way. Uh, the way seems cloudy because we haven't kept ourselves in the position of this life the state of ourselves in this life uh, according to God's desires. And so there, the flesh wants to do things on its own. The flesh wants to come up with its own plan. The flesh wants to be satisfied all day long. And you, you realize that from the moment you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed. And so we read in John chapter 15 about this struggle, this battle that goes on uh, for Especially for people who have been saved, who, who really trust that Jesus Christ is their only hope, have, have believed on him, and have been sealed by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit of God, until the day of redemption. And, and they're walking in that truth, and they desire, they desire to direct their lives to be pleasing before God, and it's evident before man. It manifests itself in your family, in your schoolhouse, in your workplace, in the church assembly, and people can see it. And, and when you're not in that frame of mind, if you're not in that state, that condition of obedience unto God, and trying to live lives that are so pleasing to Him, uh, when you're not in that condition, uh, it shows on you. It just shows on. People see it right away. And you can hide it as best you can, but it's in your face. And it's in your walk. And it's how you talk. All these things are indicators uh, for those around you. Because God knows your heart. We often don't know each other's heart. We don't know uh, the thoughts and intents of our uh, I don't know what yours are. You probably don't know what mine are. But God sees the heart. And it's a very deceitful organ, uh, a very deceitful thing within us. Uh, not, not the physical heart, but that, that spiritual heart uh, that God uh, instills in every in, in person. Uh, the inner man, the soul, which needs to be saved. So in, in the, the best way to get the victory in this struggle, in this battle that's upon you day after day after day after day, which wears you down. You know, people are excited to, to be saved. You know, people are excited to go to war and, and uh, they, you know, they dress up and they parade and they prepare and uh, they're deployed and they go out on the battlefield. And it's not very long before they tire of the whole thing. And it takes a certain level of commitment, well beyond just normal living, so that you can get the victory in, in, a, in a battle, in, in a total war, because it just wears against you emotionally. So you need to be strengthened. You, you need to uh, be so firmly situated in God's truth that you can continue to bring a a productive life and live at peace with yourself. 
And John chapter 15 gives us the solution to this. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband among them. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. We're talking about the dwelling on Wednesday night, uh, how important it is to dwell and remain in, uh, in a particular place and how it relates to the Christian life. Uh, it's one of the names of this 12 tribes of Israel, and what it meant was to dwell. And abiding is to dwell. Uh, you, you abide in Bethel Baptist Church because, I don't know, maybe you like what they do here. Maybe you like uh, the, the atmosphere. Maybe you like uh, the doctrine. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you've made some friends, longtime friends for a while, but you abide for specific reasons. And, and he says here, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. So there you, there's your position. If you're in Christ, he's the one that brings life-giving energy into your life. That vine, that it, it travels through the roots, through the vine, and into the branches. You're a branch if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, he that abideth in me, in verse 5, uh, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. Amen. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That doesn't mean that you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, you decided not to abide in Christ, you're not going to hell. When God saves you, you are saved. And you can only be saved if you really meant that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said, God knows your heart, whether you have done that or not. And it should be evident to you whether you've done that or not as well. So he goes on. If ye abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you. See, see what's got to abide in you? Christ abides in you through his spirit, and he also abides in you through the word of God. Those things can never be separated. What happens when you separate the Holy Spirit from the Word of God? Chaos. Disaster. You wonder why there's so many denominations in the world? That's the reason why. People doing that which is right in their own eyes. They, they, they see something and they say, well, you know, I know God says that, but we're going to do it anyways. He says, don't do that, but <laughs> well, I'll do it or I don't. But you got the Word's got to abide in. Christ abides in you. Verse 8 says, herein is my Father glorified. When you got saved, and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you called upon him to be your Savior, you glorified God. Because that's the way of salvation. He's the one, he's the designer of the way of salvation. If you've designed your own way of salvation, you did not glorify God. But God was glorified when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, called upon him, and then he sealed you into the day of redemption. And you belong to him now. You are not your own. He bought you with a price, his precious blood. So, God did all, did all these things for us. What should we render unto God? What should we render unto the one who loved us and saved us? Now that's a question that has an answer to it, but I wonder if our answers are the same, or do they match up with what God says? So herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. All right, verse number 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to those, that group of men uh, who were with him 
during his ministry. We can take these words and apply it to the church today, even though it was spoken in Old Testament times. So Old Testament times have transitioned after the death of Christ to become New Testament times, and now we can apply these truths to us. It doesn't say God, today God doesn't do everything you ask him to do. Why is that? Well, he just, he just, you know, maybe it's your spiritual condition. Maybe it's something else. I, I don't know anybody who gets every prayer answered. I've never heard of anybody like that. But my wife in particular, though, she gets a lot of her prayers answered, so I just ask her to pray for me. And it, it's helped. It's been a blessing, you know. And there are times when God's answered my uh, pleas for help. Uh, whether, you know, whether being a pastor or a husband or a dad, all those things are important to me because they're responsibilities that God has laid upon me. So, so this word fruit, fruitful, the word fruitful in the King James Bible is find, found 35 different times. And now it means a very productive, producing in abundance. So the Lord, once he saves us, expects us as his children to produce fruitful lives which bless mankind and glorify God. Now that only stands to reason. You have a, a child born into your family. Well, there's a lot of training that has to take place. There's a lot of understanding that needs to be uh, taught also along with the knowledge. And you're hoping that your efforts in raising up this child is going to produce someone that's going to have a productive life. And there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. There's going to be failures and there's going to be triumphs. And same thing in the Christian life. So you're going to have to take the effort. You're going to have to be the one who put yourself in the right place where God can build you up and where he can bring forth fruit in your life because of your willingness to allow that to happen. And again, uh, you may not be willing. You might not have that mindset where you really want to be, uh, bring honor and glory to the one you're going to stand before and give an account for your life. Uh, I, I'm thinking of something. My, my wife, before we were married, she was telling me and growing up, she'd want to do different things in her life, and her father would never say no, but he would lay out the consequences if she did. Not punishments, but what could happen. And it cost her not to do many of those things. And, and so when we go around trying to do things our own way, when we feel like it, and uh, we, we're neglecting the moving of God in our lives and the desire to bring forth more fruit for his glory, for his glory, not for some reward for us, but for his honor and his glory, who did all these things for us. So, so what's the best thing we can render unto God? It's ourselves. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is just your reasonable service. And that's the important part of being a believer in Jesus Christ. You can only be ministered to so much. You can only hear so much preaching until now it's your turn in, in like manner to bring that truth to somebody else. To inform somebody else about the things that God has opened up your eyes to. And if we neglect to do those things, well, there's not any fruit involved with that. We've got a neighbor who, who uh, likes to grow things, and we're beneficiaries of that. So many of you, you have gardens, and you will bring the your produce from your gardens when it's super abundant, and, and you distribute among everybody gets a, a, to, to get an enjoyment out of those things. But God expects a spiritual uh, cornucopia, as you would. <laughs> That's that big horn with all the vegetables coming out of it. And pictorially, uh, but a spiritual cornucopia of blessings and uh, joys and friendships and kindnesses that are going to be just uh, glorifying God. So, that new walk, that new talk, the abundant life Jesus spoke of in the Bible. Now, in times past, before you repented and turned to Jesus Christ, we were considered dead in trespasses and sins. But now, and then we can only produce evil fruit. But now, in Christ, we're, we've been planted in, in the 
life-giving chemistry, if you would. I don't know what, what's the best thing to say, but we're in Christ. He is life itself. He is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. And if you're in him, that life wants to flow through you so that that life can be such a, a blessing, not only to yourselves but others. There was a tree that in Jesus' travels, uh, he cursed. He cursed this tree. It's in Luke chapter 13 and uh, in verse number 6. But uh, it had no fruit on it, and, and it just had leaves. I bought a, a fig tree probably about half a dozen years ago. And that thing grows taller than me. It grows at least six feet tall, broad, thick leaves like this all over the beautiful looking plant. Not a single fig on it. Not one single fig in six years. I keep putting different things in the ground, trying to make it work okay. Not a single, it's, it's growing again. It's growing. I said, forget it. I'm not even going to protect it during the winter time. You're supposed to protect it. Cover it up with leaves and plastic and all kinds of stuff. I said, forget it. Forget it. It starts growing again. I don't know. I guess I got to leave it there for another year or so and then throw it out. Uh, but there's this fig tree, and it was a type of Israel. It, it represents Israel itself because he's talking about repentance before he comes across this fig tree. He says, oh, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And that was the main thing. And every time Jesus tells them a truth, he brings a parable in. And so this is the parable. He spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and he saw it from there on and found none. And then it says, he, he, he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumber the, the ground? Now, cumbering, uh, cumbersome is, is your taking up energy. And, and here this fig tree was just drawn up life-giving uh, sources from the plantage uh, that's around it. And, and he says, I want you to, it's covering the ground, get rid of it. And the vineyard, the keeper of the vineyard, answers him and said, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. Now, God is not finished with Israel. They're going to go through the worst times they've ever seen. And they've been through some bad times. And their enemies are going to get the best of them. And God's going to allow that. And it won't matter how much you pray. It won't matter how much you give. It's just going to happen. Because God says it's going to happen. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 30, we read, And the remnant that has escaped to the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So not only is he going to preserve a remnant, he's going to reestablish Israel. They will inherit the land. All of this stuff that's going on right now, it won't be heard of anymore when Jesus Christ does what he says he's going to do. Now, he's made promises towards you who believe on him. He says, if you will do what I ask you to do, he says, I'm going to bless you. If you refuse to do what I'm asking you to do, my child, whom I bought with my own blood, well, then, you know, you're going to suffer loss. Well, we don't like suffering loss. We don't like it when a friend dies or a, a family member uh, is encumbered. Uh, we, we don't like it when uh, we fail. We don't like many, many things in this life. But God says, listen, I am here, and I am willing to work with you and through you and in you, but you have to make yourself a willing object for me to work through. So these promises are often attached to our own yielding unto him. So, uh, Israel, right? It, it's strange when you look at this uh, parable, Jesus' ministry has been going on for about three years now. And so the vine dresser, you know, the owner of the, the vine the vineyard, of course, is, would be God, Israel's vineyard, and, and uh, Jesus would be the, the keeper. And so he says, well, give it another year. Maybe after, you know, Maybe another year of my ministry here, these things will uh, turn around. Israel will repent. And the, so this was the whole key about repentance. Now, Israel's partially blinded uh, to the truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And one day they'll look upon him whom they have pierced and they will say, it's him. And boy, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be all different at that time. 
There's a church made up of both Jews and Gentiles right now. That's what it is. Repentant Jews and repentant Gentiles. And branches who don't produce fruit, the initial fruit of the Spirit of God planted in their heart, God's going to cast into a lake of fire one day. Those are people who never repented, never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and never will. And they'll be cast into that lake of fire, and they'll be destroyed with that. Now, this church is to glorify the risen Savior. It's expected to be productive, both within itself, amongst the believers, the brethren, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, and outwardly in the ministry of God's word to a lost world, in the anticipated attempt that it's going to produce some spiritual fruit. People coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, churches being planted who honor and glorify not only God, but the Word of God. Now, 2 Peter 3, 9 reminds us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering uh, to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Brother Ernie brought that out this morning. What does it mean to repent? It means to turn away from what you are doing. And so this is something that if you're doing something opposing God's will, you need to repent of that. And when you do, you will start more production of a fruitful life. I don't know how it is in most of your families, but I know that when things get disruptive in my house, I'm not happy, and nobody's happy. And things have to change for there to be peace. There, it, it, I'm not talking about compromise. I'm just talking about obeying God. I've seen church problems. Now look at the multitude of empty places in this body's uh, church house here today. And you see that were these really necessary at one time? Yeah, pretty much they were. That space in between the rows of pews over there, that's where that wall there used to be. And they had to knock that down. And what, why, why was that? Because people were repenting. They were turning to Jesus Christ. They were looking for a good church home. And so many, many flocked together on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday night, Sunday afternoons, Wednesday nights, Saturday mornings, Friday afternoons, Thursday afternoons. The place was a, a, just a, a, a hot house of, of uh, Bible instruction and Bible obedience. It was wonderful to see. I've never seen anything like that. It's amazing. I, I hate that I have to talk about it as something that was and not is. And a lot of that may fall on my own shoulders for the uh, responsibility for that. But this is what he's telling us. According to that verse that God's not slack, it, it's God's will that sinners come to repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They have to believe that gospel. Now, every time a soul is saved, Satan suffers a great defeat, but that doesn't mean that he's going to leave you alone. He's an enemy, and you're to resist him steadfast. And he'll toy with your emotions. He'll toy with your physical body if he can. He'll get you into positions and thoughts that are vain thoughts. We were talking about uh, those kind of foolish thoughts last week a little bit. Uh, but you have something that the devil doesn't have and never can have, and that's Christ in you. He's anti-Christ. You're pro-Christ. You're, you're for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 1 John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, victory never comes easily. It, it's sometimes just so wearisome and so uh, wearing on the, the psych, psyche that you always have to be keeping yourself in the love of God. You have to do that. It's something that needs to happen day by day. So we're going to look at what God's Word has to say, which is the sword of the Spirit, and how it can give us a winning strategy on the battlefield of this craziness thing about trying to be fruitful for the Lord. Because the, the child of God ought to be willing to please his parents after... So many years of them taking care of you, you want to do something back to them. What can we render unto God for his blessings? 
Well, you may have planted a garden this year. You may have a flower garden, you may have a rock garden, maybe you have a pet rock and talk to him at night, I don't know what you have. But vegetable gardens, all these gardens you're hoping because you had to spend some money for seed or uh, someone had to give you plantings and you transplanted those into an area there. Where you put that plant, where it's located, the soil content, uh, the watering of it, the care of it, all depends on how much fruit you're going to get out of it. So we're going to look at things that way this morning. There has to be, first of all, a planting. You have to be planted in Christ. And you can't abide in Christ if you've never become uh, a believer in him and are trusting in him. Psalm 1 verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree. The blessed man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. So there's a lot of people going to church this morning all over this world and uh, across the sea. They've already had their Sunday, but here we are and people are gathering together. And where are they planted? Where have they planted themselves? Are they getting God's truth? That's another aspect of Merlin Ernie's lesson this morning. And uh, getting God's truth, finding the right word, the right book. The right book is the King James Bible. But understanding these things and utilizing them are what's important for us. We, if we can own a Bible and never read it. We can, we can uh, clean it off every once in a while and make it look like we've been looking at it. But if we're not in that book and trying to learn from it, not just to read words. I find myself doing it. I'll be reading the Bible and I can pronounce every word except for somebody's name. And then I look down there and I say... Then I have to stop and ask myself after I read a chapter or two, say, what did I just read? <laughs> I'm astounded that my mind has been somewhere else while my eyes are reading every word in my mind. Oh, I read that before. Yeah, have you ever applied it? See, that's the thing. You may have a garden shed full of the right tools, the right fertilizer, you know, the netting and all that to keep the uh, uh, little pests away from the thing. Uh, but if you, if you don't utilize it, what good is it for you? You have been blessed with the armor of God. Uh, and if you don't utilize it, it will not be helpful for you. It, it's not an automatic thing. You have to put it on. And the fruit of the Spirit is in you. But if you don't cultivate that, that fruit of the Spirit, you see, you're going to wither away. You won't, you won't be dead and cast away into a fire someday. You'll make it. But you'll make it by the skin of your teeth. And then, then, you know, what praise will you have to God for that? Well, your life, my life, we, we could compare them to a garden. Now, I don't like doing bad things anymore. I used to enjoy it. Those are the lusts and desires of my own heart. And I used to just enjoy it. I didn't ever really want to hurt anybody. Sometimes people got hurt. And I didn't like that aspect of it. And I just, you know, did things that uh, pleased me. And when I got saved, I, I came under deep conviction about many, many of those things. And I became very, very sorrowful for it. And it was some time before I was able to overcome that sorrow through repentance. And not doing those things anymore that were harmful and hurtful, not only to of those around me, but myself as a new Christian in Christ. So there's some aspects up there. And I have to first begin in Christ. Uh, it's a planting that is necessary. Uh, Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So we have some people, they spread the word of God. Uh, they'll, they'll just distribute gospel tracts. By the way, this side over here, why does this thing come back off with all the tracks on Empty that out next Sunday. This one always comes back empty. And take those things and use them. You know, spread the word of God. Come on. Okay. Oh, we got that out. Well, we'll watch it. I see it's right there. Anyways. So, 
uh, this uh, gospel was shown intended to by believers. We didn't just let the Holy Spirit go around and do what he wanted to do. But people have to hear the word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk. He utilizes the written word to get the word out, and he uses us to get that word out. But notice, it's God who gives that increase. So why are we unproductive in bearing spiritual fruit? Now, I heard the first time I heard this, um, somebody preach out of this portion of scriptures, they applied it to winning souls to Christ, which is... A part of it. It's, it's applied to that way too. But that fruit of the Spirit inside every believer, that needs to be really fertilized and weeded out. And just like our own lives where things spring up and we get weeds growing in our beautiful garden. It's supposed to be a beautiful garden that God designed and, and we're just yielding fruit and being a blessing and then those weeds start coming up and the insects start coming in eating the leaves and then the fruit of the thing the squirrels come in the chipmunks arrive the birds come in and they all they just decimate the whole aspect of your garden and they'll do the same thing to you in your own heart and your own mind and that ought not so to be ought to be a fruitful vine something that will produce a beautiful thing for the glory of God. And, and uh, if we don't do these things, uh, then, then we're, we're guilty of neglect. Uh, it's a divine plan. The seed is the word of God. God's the one that gives it the power. And all we are supposed to do is to sow it. Take these tracks. Lead them around places. Uh, hand them to somebody. Let's have a conversation about you know, Try, try to let that come out and just say, you know, here's something I'd like you to read sometime. Um, you don't know anybody anything but to love them. That's, that's all. And what greater love than to show someone the way of eternal life, the way of salvation. So we have the Holy Spirit within us, so that's the first planting. The planting is there. Now, the placement, the placement, where... It says in Psalm 1, verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So your surroundings are important. Uh, your companions are important. We talked about that, about friendships uh, a couple of weeks ago. Your buddies and your friends from your former life should be told what has become of you since you trusted Jesus as your Savior. How come you don't hang around with us? Or why do you continue to hang around with us? <laughs> you know, you, we don't do those things that you should be doing. And we don't want to do the things you're doing. Your church is important. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that applies in the church house too. So uh, get in a church that believes God's word. Serve others in it. And support it. Support it not only financially. But support it by being there when we're gathered together. Or when there's a, a, a volunteer situation. Or there's a time when we're going to do a, a major outreach. Just, just show up. Present your body a living sacrifice. You will sacrifice yourself for your job. You will sacrifice yourself for your financial gain. You will sacrifice yourself for whatever it is that your heart is attached to. But let yourself sacri be sacrificed for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, Growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ necessitates proper surroundings. Sunlight. S-O-N, light. The Son of God's light. If you're going to plant your plant in a place where it's partial sunshine, partial shade, full sunshine, all shade. Plants have various places where they need to be planted, and that's just the atmosphere around them. The soil where it's planted is also very, very important. They have these things called uh, bags of miracle grow or uh, stuff that you can just put in the ground, stick your plant in that thing and soil is so rich and, and nutrients. That plant shoots up. My neighbor from down the street gave me this scrawny little tomato plant and he says, I thought maybe you could do something with this thing and I took a little bucket that one of Bev's flowers came in and I loaded the thing up with that miracle grow. I stuck the plant in there the way he wanted and a week later, I had to call him and say, you ought to come up and see this thing. It's twice the size. And it really worked. 
This is the miracle grow that you needed to be spread around in your life. You need to have the word of God. And I don't mean handy. I mean in here and in here. So that you know exactly what uh, these ingredients are supposed to do for you. Fellowship every day with Jesus. He's the light of the world. Does your countenance, your, your facial expression shine from a very close relationship with Jesus? It would, it would take time for you. It would be prayer and Bible reading and then obedience to that word. And then there's the water that's necessary. Showers. I've showered a couple of nice showers here this past week. The water of God's word. And not water downwards. You got a, a New International Version, you got an American Standard Version, you got anything but a King James Bible, you got a watered down Bible that will do you hardly any good whatsoever. Yeah. And you will find out, my friends, that uh, we were we are right. And the people, they just will go ahead with that. You know why you have women preachers? And then I be. You know why they're allowing all of this uh, Psychedelic color flag, LGBTQ, two plus one, a double, triple A. Uh, they, uh, honest, that just keeps extending because they don't have the right word of God. <clears throat> and all I got is love, love, love covers a multitude of sin. That's a Bible verse, really, out of the King James Bible. Well, listen, God, God's not going to just let that happen. That's when somebody does something against you personally. And you're going to show love in return and hope that they will repent. So, Christ, who's he? Oh, he's the one who loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? Well, so that he might sanctify it from the rest of the world. We're supposed to be so different than the world. We're not supposed to dress like the world. We're not supposed to live like the world. We're not supposed to act like the world. We're in the world. But he wants to sanctify. There should be an evident distinction between you as a saved person and your lost neighbor. And they ought to be hearing the gospel from you. And maybe they don't want anything to do with you. But that does not relieve you or I of our responsibilities that God has placed upon us. And why did he want it sanctified and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word so that he could present it to himself one day? Do you ever work for your own gift? Do you ever, do you ever just say, I, I really want this thing. I tell you, I could use this thing. This thing, I just love this thing. Maybe it was a car. I don't know. Maybe it was a, who knows, whatever, rifle, whatever, whatever it could be. Just, just say, swimming pool, whatever. And you just save and you work and you, and you put money away and you invested some money so that it would grow and increase. And, and then that day came when you finally had all the money necessary to purchase that thing. And you, you went and got that thing and you presented it to yourself and says, oh, why'd you put that in? Well, I just did it for me. I did it for me because, because I deserve it. Don't you think Jesus deserves something for what he's done for you and I? Do you ever question yourself, Lord, what can I do for you? I know what I'll do. I'll show up for church. <laughs> Big deal. You can get what I'm giving you right now sitting at home reading your own Bible. But God said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So we don't. We gather together. And the more, the merrier. So he's going to present it to himself a glorious church not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing like I have, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So the word of God is the life-giving substance, the life-cleansing element, the refreshing and sustaining uh, properties for us to produce a life pleasing to God. And it doesn't stop at coming to church service. And then being rooted and grounded in Christ, that takes place in your heart. That's where this all comes from. The uses of life come from the heart, enriched the makeup of your inner man to produce excellent fruit to be desired. So the soil is important where you plant things, where you're situated, your church. You 
will always get the Word of God here. You will get it straight, straight from the King James Bible. You may get an opinion here and there, but we're going to tell you it's our opinion, and we can't really prove it out of Scripture. But sometimes our opinions make sense because it's based on, foundationally on the Word of Truth. But you don't have to believe an opinion. You need to believe God's Word. And you should be, by now, most of you, <clears throat> when I'm looking around at your age, and my age, and how long I've known you, you ought to be able to discern right from wrong when it comes to doctrine by now. Or you're not putting much into it. And there has to be a perseverance here. We would have never won World War II <clears throat> if we just, uh, you know, just got tired and threw down our weapons and surrendered. Fought to the end. It cost many of their lives. Many people who might have been sitting where you're sitting today. Many who would have appreciated having a family and a life uh, that they were productive in. And, and for us to be in their place, in their stead, and uh, producing zero, so, uh, we ought to at least be struggling and striving to do this, but it takes perseverance. Psalm 103 says, brings forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It, it's a shall thing, it's not a might thing or a could thing, it's it shall, shall prosper. So put your hands on the plow, get plowed, brother, and, and get involved, and you have a suggestion about something we ought to be doing, and just let's hear the suggestion, and let's get it going. If it's scriptural. The believer, like a tree, in order to be fruitful, must endure some things. It has to be able to be preserved against disease and insects. Disease is crippling. Uh, things that hinder us, you know, they're, they're difficult things. But temptations, uh, false doctrine, that's another thing. Being careful about false doctrine and yielding to it should be able to identify false doctrine. And if you're uncertain about it, it, come and see. The men of this church here can tell you. There's probably women here who can tell you the, the things. So, uh, but, but God's put in the church for your benefit, uh, your edification, pastors and teachers, evangelists, for, for the benefit of the church. So we, we labor in the word of doctrine, and so we, we can point to you in certain directions about how to overcome some of the problems that you're facing in your life so that you can keep going. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. There's a lot of times I've felt like quitting. There's a lot of times, even to this very day, you know, there's, I, I, I say, you know, is, has it really been worth it, Lord, for, for, for me? I mean, what you did was totally worth it, but, but for me, I mean, you know, what, what's going on? This, this false doctrine thing, uh, I'm supposed to keep you in remembrance of the things that are true and how to overcome problems in your life. And I, I have to apply that to myself. Uh, doctrine, though, is of utmost importance to us. False doctrine will make you wither on the vine that you're attached to, which means you won't produce much fruit. Drought and heat are another enemies of good uh, production. Fears, loneliness, persecutions, yielding to temptations, all those things hinder your, your spiritual production and growth. Death and destruction of other trees, loss of Christian friends uh, through death, uh, them moving away, you know, uh, them backsliding. We, we've got some members, uh, we're praying for them that God can get a hold of their heart and get them back in church Amen. And, and struggle with that. But then there's that pruning, that thing that we really don't like. When you, you know when you trim your nails and you get a little bit too close? And, and ah, they got more. <laughs> well, John 15, 2 says, Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So it's for a benefit, right? It's a beneficial thing. When God corrects you, it's for your benefit. Amen. When he chastises you, it's for your benefit, with the hope that you will repent and yield to him and his desire. So pruning of your affections, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. What is it that your heart is so set on that it hinders your spiritual production? Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, the earth is full of distractions. Well, <laughs> you, you'll probably be the 
distracted by so many things just today. Um, maybe even right now you're distracted. <laughs> but from this point on to the rest of the day, if you could count the distractions you have when your mind is not fixed and you're not thinking about spiritual production, you'll be surprised that when you go to bed tonight, you won't even remember what I talked about today. <laughs> and then there's the uh, pruning of your activities. 1 Peter 4, 3, for the time past of our life, <laughs> years ago, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, all we know what the Gentiles do, but the church isn't supposed to be doing what the Gentiles are doing. And we know what the Jews do, but the church isn't supposed to be doing what the Jews are doing. We're supposed to be doing what the church is supposed to be doing. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, it's repentance to glorify God. It's turning away from our selfishness and our uh, inconsideration about the great gift that God has blessed us with and established us for all eternity. It's not a temporary thing. And we basically thumb our nose at God. Let my will be done, you say. And then what about your associations? We talked about this. Pruning your associations, 1 Peter 4, 4. Where they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Yeah, your friends are going to probably not be your friends. Unless you've made friends since you've gotten saved who are friendly to you. And if you want to have friends, you've got to show yourself friendly. But you can, you can fake friendship. So the thing is to be friendly. All right, here's the end. Conclusion. A fruitful mindset will produce, will produce the abundant life Jesus spoke of in John chapter 10, verse 10. I am come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. A life that will bless many and bring great rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for you and others. You cannot accomplish any lasting fruit without the Lord. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. You've got to figure that out. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. See, so it, it's fruitless to think you can do it on your own. You can't. You need the Lord. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Yes, salvation of souls. Spread the word of God. Sow the word of God. Uh, a bountiful harvest from your life at the judgment seat of Christ. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But imagine getting that from the Lord's lips about you. And not have to bring up all of your evil and all the bad. Because it, it's all going to come out. And then, good tips for your garden. Is, you know, put it in the right place with the right sunlight, the right amount of watering. Make sure the soil is good and you're going to get an abundant crop. But this is all on you. This is all you excel at things you give yourself to. You try to excel. You try to get the mastery of everything that you put your hand to. And you should. It's an important thing. Try this. Try this in the battleground of fruitfulness. Because Satan does not want you to prosper, but God does. I want you to prosper. You want me to prosper. And See, it's, it's, it's mutual because we're of the same, we're, we're planted in the same soil of the same vine. And this is not the vine of the world. This is the vine from heaven. And you're attached to it and you're his. Father, we thank you for the word of truth because it's so quick, so powerful. Sometimes, Father, it hits us in 
such a way we, we really are smitten. But repentance is important, Father. You told us that we can repent, so that if we confess our sins unto you, you're faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to be serious and we have to mean it. I pray, Father, as we give time for people to repent where they're sitting and just asking God to have mercy upon them and grace as we have in the past, that we might give ourselves into a holier life, a more productive life, a more generous, giving life, and letting all the hindrances just kind of fall by the wayside, put it in the trash bin of life, and allow our thoughts and our minds to be more creative in the things of God, more yielded to the truths of the word, more glorifying to you, Heavenly Father. What shall I render unto the Lord? Well, we've taken the cup of salvation, and now we have lives blessed by you that we can render unto you. So help us to do that, Father. Help us to become yielders and not just takers. And Father, you may be receiving all the honor you deserve. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to 89.
Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, the message here today. And uh, Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, for caring for us and uh, providing a salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Glory. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.